Hello, everybody. Good morning to those of you in New York, and good evening to those of you in Asia, and hello to those of you in other parts of the world. We're very happy to join you this today. Uh, I'm Andy Nathan. I'm a political science professor at the Weatherhead East Asian Institute. It's a very happy occasion for me because back in the day, I was the PhD advisor for Ambassador Dung. And the book that we uh, are discussing today is a version of his PhD thesis that he completed in 2003. This is really a marvelous book. Uh, it's uh, informed by his intimate knowledge, of course, of Vietnamese foreign policy making. We seldom have a book on any country really with such an intimate account of policy making, and especially from Vietnam. It's a rare, uh, rare uh, a book of rare value. Um, Ambassador Dung will be introduced by Ambassador Gui, but I just want to say that both of these gentlemen have had long distinguished careers within the Vietnamese diplomatic service. They've overlapped with each other. Uh, and it's just a matter of tremendous pride uh, to me to have been involved along the way in the career of Ambassador Dung, and uh, just very happy to see his career develop as it has done. <clears throat> what we're going to do uh, today is that uh, I will hand over to Ambassador Gui, who is the Vietnamese ambassador to the United Nations currently, formerly a uh, deputy minister of foreign affairs and before that president of the Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam and various other posts as he and Ambassador Dung rose together in the foreign service. I'm gonna hand over to him to give a more uh, detailed uh, introduction of Ambassador Dung and then Ambassador Dung is going to give some remarks about his wonderful book. And after that, uh, my colleague Lian Hang Lin is going to make some comments. And then my colleague Anne Marie Murphy is going to make some comments. And after that, we're going to open it up to QA. And if you want to ask a question or make a comment, you want to put it into the QA box that's down at the bottom right of your Zoom screen. And you can ask a question for either of the two ambassadors or for both of them, if you would like to do so. Uh, Hang will moderate those questions and uh, pass them all along to the speakers. So thank you very much for joining us. And at this point, I wanna pass it on to Ambassador Dung Dinh Gui, Vietnamese, ambassador to the United Nations for him to make some more uh, introductory remarks about Ambassador Dung. Thank you, Professor Andrew, and thank you the organizer for inviting me to join this very, uh, I mean, joyful event. Um, really honored to me because I and uh, Dr. Nguyen Vu Tung was a very good friend for a long time, more than 40 years and also co-workers more than two decades. And we also joined in several research projects up until last year. Yes. Um, Dr. Nguyen Vu Tung is now with a service ambassador of Vietnam to the Republic of Korea. And his term from uh, this year until 2023. Before this post, he served as the president of Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam. He joined the Foreign Service in 1991 and continuously working in the Institute of International Relations and now it's the uh, Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam, except for the two short period he left. First, uh, in 1996 until 1998, he studied at Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy and he earned his uh, Master of Law and Diplomacy there. And then he finished his PhD program in Columbia University and, um, and then earned the, the, the PhD on political science on Columbia University. And the second period he left the Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam is from 2010, 2014. He served as a deputy chief of mission 
of the Embassy of Vietnam in Washington, D.C. That uh, Dr. Nguyen Vu Tung said, uh, main field of study, research, and publication includes uh, international relations theories and international uh, relations in uh, Asia Pacific and Southeast Asia. And he also an expert on uh, Vietnam foreign policy and Vietnam relation with the United States, with Southeast Asia and ASEAN. So we seem very cover very fast area, vast areas. But ASEAN is really one of his main focus. That's why the book loan today is a focus on his uh, doctorate also on, on the B field study. Thank you very much. Hello. It's my turn, right? Yes, okay. it's your turn, yes. Thank you, thank you very much, Professor Nathan and Ambassador Dr. Ling Kui for the very kind introduction. I would like also to thank Professor Hang for organizing this um, event. For me personally, this is like a homecoming event. Uh, Professor Nathan, uh, he, he just said, supervised my not only my dissertation but also the whole the process of uh, learning uh, uh, when I was at the at the police science department uh, professor Anne-Marie Murphy was the uh, lecturing a course that I took which is on Southeast Asia um, and um, she she was in the uh, committee when I defended the dissertation. Um, Professor Hang was uh, first uh, engaged with me in the conference in uh, London when part of my presentation, a part of my uh, dissertation was, the, was formed and presented there. So it's really a homecoming event for me and I feel so thankful for Columbia University and the Department of Political Science for giving me such a wonderful opportunity for me to enrich my knowledge. And uh, like Professor Nathan was saying, it became a part of my intellectual uh, um, journey that uh, led me to uh, several other non-academic posting, including the United States and, and Korea now. And uh, I, I really think that uh, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, American University's connection helps me a lot because wherever I went, wherever I go, I always was able to find somebody graduating from Fletcher School or from Columbia. And it really put me on, a, on the spot because uh, these institution, institutions are really uh, widely recognized. Uh, globally. Uh, so I, I think that this book is, the, uh, for me, uh, a way of uh, thanking the uh, inst these institutions that gave me such an opportunity to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to be uh, I am who I am right now. Um, the book was the um, uh, Based on based on my dissertation, um, and that was also based on my uh, research on ASEAN and on Vietnam's uh, Vietnam's uh, foreign policy. And uh, throughout the process, I was uh, so fortunate to get the support and assistance and encouragement from many. Uh, from uh, many people, and uh, 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 one of them was the, um, um, uh, Mr. Liu Duan Huynh, uh, who Mr. Kui and Professor Hang knew quite well. He was such an, a source of encouragement and inspiration for us working on ASEAN and uh, Southeast Asia with his uh, 
um, uh, with his the, um, vast knowledge and also his personal experience. Um, the book is about um, Vietnam's decision to join ASEAN. And as a, a political scientist, uh, we were trained to answer the question, why? So why did Vietnam decide to join ASEAN? Uh, and uh, we uh, use uh, so many fancy theories to ask such, uh, to answer such a question. Uh, and I also have to thank uh, political science department of Columbia University to be so uh, friendly to many different theoretical approaches. And that um, helped me to land with the constructivist camp. And I would uh, later on explain uh, how the constructivist approach would help my research on Vietnam's decision to join ASEAN. But back to the uh, way that I try to answer the question of why Vietnam joined ASEAN. I found out that before I can answer the question why, I have to answer several questions how of how. So first is the, the question of how decision makers in Vietnam uh, views the world in the late 1980s and early 1990s before they joined ASEAN and how they read the situation at home and abroad, how they conduct policy review and judgment how they designed uh, the, uh, the course of uh, foreign policy through the make decision making process, how they defined friends and foes and how they defined the national interest. So, so, so in, order to, in order to answer uh, this, uh, the several, a couple of uh, the couples uh, uh, question of, of house, I, uh, was able to, uh, like I said, to answer the question, uh, why? So, and that helped me to uh, to find the uh, the answer through the uh, access to Vietnamese uh, the, uh, foreign policy documents. Uh, and in the book, I have explained uh, what uh, sources uh, include, they are the uh, memos, they are the cables sent uh, from the embassies abroad, they are the internal uh, 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 situational analysis, and they are also the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, party resolutions that is the distinctive to the decision-making process of Vietnam where the party uh, approved and adopted some uh, very important uh, resolutions and that the resolutions were translated into actual policies and uh, action plans. So, so the, <clears throat> the center of my research is actually the learning process where Vietnam attached greater importance to understand how the <clears throat> uh, strategic landscape around Vietnam was evolving at the time when the Cold War was coming to an end and when the, uh, uh, and when the Cambodian uh, peace resolution was reached uh, in 1991 in, in, in Paris. And uh, in fact, it is the process of what the constructivist would call the process of socialization through which a greater understanding of Vietnam about ASEAN as an organization and ASEAN members, as well as a greater understanding of ASEAN countries at that time about Vietnam. Uh, and the greater understanding would lead to the uh, greater ease for Vietnam to, uh, to participate in uh, cooperation with ASEAN and later on to 
to join the ASEAN. Um, and a greater understanding that would, uh, would that would uh, that would lead to that would lead to uh, uh, a more um, elaborate process of socialization between Vietnam and ASEAN would lead to again to the, the what the constructivists would call the uh, recognition of commonalities, and that would that would lead to what is called the uh, recognized uh, sense of identity. And the something like a smoking gun, when I was going through the files in Hanoi, I came across with uh, two types of the internal, internal documents. The internal documents before uh, 1980s, and the documents before uh, after night after uh, in the 19 in the early 1990s the first set of, of document was trying to indicate that asean countries are different from vietnam from the mode of economic social political development developmental uh, developmental growth uh, patterns and the emphasis is on the differences. And the later set of, uh, of documents was focusing on the commonality. So try this trying to imply that Vietnam and ASEAN share so many uh, points in common that uh, started from the historical background and then the uh, process of gaining independence from the uh, uh, colonizers and uh, the uh, the foreign policies goals aiming to have a greater authority uh, autonomy in uh, foreign policy making as well as the, to enjoy um, peaceful and stable ex external conditions for uh, look for domestic uh, uh, economic development so the like I said, the, the smoking gun I was able to find is something like a aha moment when I found the Politburo uh, uh, resolution. No, not resolution, political bureau, minute of meeting saying that ASEAN is like us. This is something like a full quotation. And it was not, it was not, uh, uh, it was not uh, 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 presented in the sense of, uh, uh, of, of an official uh, policy line, but it is presented in the sense of comments agreed by the people attending the Politburo uh, meeting. So ASEAN is, uh, so the, the, the line is they are like us. And in the, and in the chapter that Hang was showing in the beginning, the, when we were talking about Vietnam's policy towards ASEAN in the late 70s, the, the, the line is they are different from us. So what happened between uh, the recognitions of difference and the recognitions of commonality is the process of uh, socialization where a greater understanding of Vietnam about ASEAN countries and vice versa, a greater understanding of ASEAN countries about Vietnam would help to smoothen the uh, the 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 uh, process of Vietnam joining ASEAN uh, by uh, seeing the commonalities in um, the uh, way the two, I mean the uh, ASEAN countries and Vietnam views the world, read the situation abroad at home, and define national interests and accordingly define friends and foes. So. Uh, so the foreign policy of Vietnam uh, toward ASEAN that was based on the commonality, uh, not only led, led to the decision to join ASEAN, and that is the part of the of explanation why Vietnam joined ASEAN, but also uh, suggests the future trend of uh, Vietnam toward ASEAN. So the uh, foreign policy based on commonality seems to indicates a more hopeful and more um, 
optimistic uh, undertone when Vietnam is becoming more and more committed to ASEAN. And, and I think that uh, the first uh, um, uh, several paragraphs in my book uh, suggest the um, current event when Vietnam shows the full commitment to ASEAN that was uh, reflected not only in the uh, documents of the uh, party congress resolution, but also in the acts like the Vietnam chairmanship of ASEAN 2020 and, uh, uh, and, and the very recent open debate at the UN under the uh, 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 under the leadership of Ambassador Quy to, uh, to connect the role of the regional organizations such as ASEAN with, uh, uh, in the greater context of, uh, uh, of the United Nations where the regional organizations would have the uh, global uh, multilateral uh, arrangements in, uh, in the, uh, with a specific uh, advantage and uh, and commitment so 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 basically that was the 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 uh, the, the, the uh, research on my uh, uh, on the decision of vietnam to join asean uh, the last point before i end my presentation here is why the book was uh, introduced in 2020 the uh, 21 the aim is 2020 because uh, that was the the, uh, the year when Vietnam celebrated uh, uh, the 25th uh, the anniversary of uh, joining ASEAN. But because of the editing process, uh, it took more than uh, more time than I uh, expected, and the decision was made by the by the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies in Singapore, in Singapore to publish in 2021. Um, that was uh, not originally planned by me and by Professor Andrew Nathan because we aim at uh, some uh, publishers in the United States. But um, I was a bit busy at that time to, uh, uh, to uh, revise the book accordingly to the suggestions by American publishers. So, uh, so when I found time, I was able to publish, but not uh, publish the book, but not uh, in the US as uh, we originally planned, it, uh, planned but in the uh, in Singapore. But uh, we are happy that finally the research uh, can see uh, can see the daylight, even though many parts of many parts of uh, the books was published elsewhere in various uh, um, occasions. But uh, the uh, the the good thing of having uh, of, of having the book uh, that uh, introduced on the uh, part in a single uh, volume uh, can uh, uh, can be a good thing. So uh, I am uh, I end my uh, introductory remarks here, and uh, I'm more than happy to engage in the Q and A sessions. So thank you very much again. Thank you so much, Ambassador Thom. Uh, today um, is very exciting for me um, in thinking back, uh, as you mentioned, when, when we first met, I was a, a graduate student. Um, and when I heard your presentation at this uh, wonderful conference that did end up becoming this book, which you mentioned, um, edited by Adarna Westad and Sophie Quinjudge on the Third Indochina <coughs> War. Um, for me, as a, as a scholar of uh, Vietnamese foreign policy, particularly in the Second Indochina War uh, during the period of the, of the Vietnam War in particular, um, your presentation at that conference was, was extremely exciting uh, because it was the first time I had heard uh, a deeply, um, you know, sort of uh, critical uh, evaluation of Vietnamese foreign policy uh, in the 1970s and particularly 
regarding this question about sort of missed opportunities, misunderstandings between the uh, between Vietnam and ASEAN. Um, and when you had made that argument um, at that conference, um, I had been you know mainly reading official histories of uh, Vietnamese foreign affairs, and it, it rarely ever parted from from the official lines. So to hear um, your presentation back in the early aughts, uh, I was waiting very eagerly uh, for this book. Um, so I'm so happy that it is out and congratulations to you. Uh, to our audience today, I would go out and buy this book. Um, it, as Professor Nathan uh, mentioned, it is extremely um, insightful uh, and just uh, amazing to have something like this in terms of uh, seeing uh, a scholar uh, as well as a policymaker really break down the decision-making process with regard to uh, Vietnam's decision to join ASEAN in ways that you know we we, we rarely see. Um, so for me, you know, I, I read this. Um, basically in one sitting uh, because I was consumed by these insights that you had just uh, you know basically gave to us right now in your presentation um, particularly with regard to these new materials that um, you know that that we've we've never seen before and other uh, histories of, of Vietnamese farm policy so I guess my um, my comments or my questions um, really you know they're 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 they, they can be grouped in, in three categories. The first is, you know, while you were, you know, to me, really the, the pioneer, you were at the vanguard of this very exciting, um, you know, sort of uh, not critical approach, but you you weren't giving the official line in terms of, of uh, you know, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, what it, what it had to wrestle with uh, in the late Cold War era, uh, particularly after the Second Indochina War. Uh, but since then, I, I, you know, there've been so many other books that have come out in particular, you know, I'm thinking about, um, you know, there's, there's, there's David Elliott, there's Coastal Path, uh, there's Huy Duc, um, and a lot of them have now sort of tackled this period, particularly the, the late 1970s and 1980s, uh, with regard to, um, you know, sort of Vietnam's decision uh, to engage in the Third Indochina War. And as I'm seeing already in our Q&A, uh, we have, uh, uh, Hoang Minh Vu, uh, who is, uh, I think, the next generation of, of scholars, um, and you know, he just earned his his PhD at Cornell. Who, you know, is going to publish um, a major work on the Third Indochina War. But since then, you know, I, I wonder um, if you've had the chance, you know, when you're not. Um, when you're not practicing diplomacy uh, in South Korea, if you've had an opportunity to read uh, these newer works and what you what your assessment is of the sort of more recent um, historiography, and I forgot to also mention Thun Vu, uh, but they all have different interpretations uh, of you know sort of uh, decision makers in in Hanoi, uh, whether they were you know sort of um, who was really sort of winning out in terms of of, of forging farm policy at this time in the late 70s and 80s? Was it military firsters? Was it, you know, the, the defeat of the, uh, you know, sort of economy firsters? Um, what is the relationship sort of between, um, you know, sort of the, the, the party and, and infighting, as you see in this period uh, with regard to Vietnam's decision to not pursue ASEAN? If you could speak a little bit more to that in particular about these newer uh, newer works that, that have come out um, since, uh, since we, we went to the, that hunting lodge in the early 2000s uh, and had that conference. Uh, my second question or, or sort of comments um, really uh, is about, you know, uh, as you mentioned, Lu Duang Hun, the indomitable Lu Duang Hun. Um, his, you know, I, I saw personal papers uh, mentioned in your footnotes uh, in the chapters. And I, if I could just ask you because, you know, I, I still have very fond memories of him um, at these Cold War conferences in the early aughts. Um, and he just, you know, when, when he spoke, the, the command uh, not only of the awareness of U.S. domestic politics during the Vietnam War, but even today uh, was, uh, was amazing. I mean, he, he knew more about sort of uh, U.S. politics uh, than most Americans uh, uh, when, when, whenever he came to the conference and when he had, you know, a perfect anecdote to bring up uh, about Kissinger, about the anti-war movement then. Um, but if you could speak a little bit more to his personal papers um, and what you were able to have access to. Um, and when I bring in, uh, you know, sort of my question about the indomitable, um, indomitable uh, Ludwig, when 
I'm also, I guess my question, this is connected um, to Ambassador Guiz, um, when you reference him in, in Flying Blind. Uh, and in particular, it's, again, I know that, you know, you all don't have access to this yet, or you possibly do. On page 159, um, you quote uh, in, an, in an interview uh, with Ambassador Gui uh, that speaks to, and this is, this is in the early 2000s, uh, according to Ambassador Gui, um, there was tacit acknowledgement of the weak capacity of the Foreign Service and of other institutional arrangements that support the country's international relations. These weaknesses represent major obstacles to Hanoi's efforts to enhance international and regional, regional cooperation, according to Ambassador Gui. If I could ask you to uh, expand on that, because one of the things that I see in my uh, scholarship on the history of Vietnamese foreign policy in, in the Cold War era is that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, was was extremely forward thinking, and there were individuals uh, occupying various desks within MOFA, uh, within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, who were you know extremely diligent, extremely conscientious scholars, uh, researchers uh, of of foreign affairs, of international relations, like uh, Lu Duang Hun and like you know like yourselves. So I wonder you know if you could speak more to this. Um, this evolution of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, you know, wh what were the challenges that that held, uh, you know, uh, the 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 officials within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs from doing more of its of its good work? Uh, and when I say more of its good work, it's amazing thorough research uh, that I saw at least during the the Second Indochina War and the Vietnam War, and then going through the 70s, 80s to the 90s, uh, and finally, you know, uh, in in the period uh, even um, you know as your book takes us into the the early 2000s. Um, but if that's possibly a question for the both of you, because this is something that, that came out of, of your um, interview uh, with Ambassador Gui. Um, and then my final, uh, and this is connected, um, deals with the roles of individuals. Um, we just had an amazing summer in which Ambassador Gui uh, and Ambassador Hakim Ngop um, put together an amazing set of, of um, events, webinars, and, and uh, Zoom meetings about the role of Winga Tat. Uh, if you could speak to his role in your book, he is mentioned. Uh, but again, one of these really, you know, sort of amazing visionaries who knew very early on, if not as early as 1973, that Vietnam needed to, uh, you know, research other countries uh, in terms of, of um, its economic development, development and not just the Soviet Union uh, and the socialist countries that he, as early as 1973, was saying, perhaps we should look at these capitalist countries. Um, and you know, of course that, that wouldn't really come into fruition much as your book um, talks about until Noi Mai uh, and even into the late 1980s. But, but what was his role um, in, in particularly your first, um, well, actually throughout your whole book. Uh, and I'll leave it there because I actually also had a question about Fan Bang Dong, but I, I'm, I'm wary, there, you know, there, there are lots of questions and I also wanna, wanna give it over to, um, to, to Anne-Marie uh, to give comments that are really focused on, on uh, you know, Vietnam ASEAN relations today and moving forward. But before I do, I just wanna say congratulations again, kudos to you uh, for writing uh, this, this amazing book. Well, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to be here. It's delighted to be uh, part of uh, Ambassador Tung's homecoming uh, to Colombia. And like my colleague Hang, I cannot recommend this book, Flying Blind, um, highly enough. Um, I am not a Vietnamese expert by any stretch of the mean. Uh, but I did write a dissertation at Columbia University on ASEAN's creation, and I have followed the organization fairly closely. So what I thought I could do today was to make just a couple of comments about some of the, the gaps and really fascinating things that came out of this book to me um, that I really hadn't known before, and then kind of place uh, the book in the broader regional context and a few um, contemporary comments. Because uh, although the book is primarily historic in nature, you do open the book with um, a quote about uh, the critical importance of ASEAN to Vietnam on the occasion of its 25th 
uh, anniversary and as Vietnam took over the chair of ASEAN um, in late 2019. And even though Vietnam had that horrific challenge of chairing ASEAN, right? An organization that works on personal meetings and behind the scenes diplomacy, uh, by all accounts, Vietnam did an excellent job of of really navigating um, through that year. So um, the first point I wanna make, um, Ambassador Tung, is to follow up on your, what I thought was a really fascinating discussion of this shift in Vietnamese identity um, that you talk and your use of constructivism um, in the book. Uh, because you state that it was critical for Vietnam to change its identity and its view um, of the other uh, Southeast Asian countries. Um, and you say that in the post 75 to 78 period, Vietnam lacked a sophisticated worldview, didn't understand the complexities of international politics and was, as you state, and I quote, a prisoner of its own communist ideology. Um, and then you write that after the collapse of the Soviet bloc and China's refusal to lead um, an alliance of uh, the remaining socialist uh, countries, that Vietnam was in an identity crisis, right? And that joining ASEAN helped to overcome that. And you make this fascinating point that before Vietnam could join ASEAN, which is open to a session by other Southeast Asian countries, that Vietnam had to think of itself as a Southeast Asian country. And that during this period of shifting from viewing other countries and emphasizing the differences to the commonalities, you make the point that in Vietnam, you began to have academic institutions rewriting and searching for history to justify this, that you had archeological research going on to try to find these historical basis for thinking of Vietnam as a Southeast Asian country. And that just struck me as fascinating um, because as you will know, so many people would argue that there is no Southeast Asian common history, right? That the region only really got that name uh, in the wake of World War II, right? Um, and you may recall that Don Emerson wrote a classic 1984 article asking whether Southeast Asia was more of a rose, something that existed, you could touch it, you could smell it, or was Southeast Asia a unicorn? Something that was imaginary in our minds, but might be able to come to fruition. And so I thought that this juxtaposition of Vietnam looking for historical reasons to justify its uh, nature, if you will, as a Southeast Asian country, um, was just fascinating. And as somebody who did a lot of research in the time of ASEAN's creation, what you often heard from people involved in the process of resolving confrontation and creating ASEAN was precisely how different all of the original members were in their worldviews, in their histories of colonies of different powers, right? I mean, Southeast Asia is so diverse, it was called the Balkans of Asia. And I recall distinctly um, Sunarso, who was Indonesia's first ambassador to Singapore and played a very prominent role in inter-ASEAN affairs, telling me we thought so differently, and that it took almost a decade for the original ASEAN five members to kind of overcome their differences and the organization almost didn't survive that first decade. So I thought it was fascinating to read your discussion of Vietnam trying to find these commonalities because it was the same process that many of the original ones had to do and that at the end, 
what you found was that the commonality was that ASEAN was an organization dedicated to promoting regime legitimacy, right? For its members and that that was gonna come primarily through economic and socio-development, which in turn required a stable international environment. And therefore ASEAN's mode of international regional cooperation was designed to create this kind of benign environment. And many people would argue that it was that future oriented idea, right? That the Southeast Asian countries might not have shared that much of a cultural uh, common heritage, right? That helped facilitate uh, regionalization in Europe, but they had a common vision of what they wanted to see, which was rising living standards uh, and keeping the great powers out. So I thought that was very fascinating and it reinforced a lot of kind of earlier strands in the literature of the, the non um, Vietnamese states. Um, and the second kind of key comment or point I wanted to make was the international context uh, during the 1990s, uh, as you talk about it. Um, well, actually, one other comment on this economic development. Um, you know, I spend a lot of time in Indonesia, and I distinctly recall in 1996, when I was doing dissertation research, that many of my Indonesian interlocutors would tell me about trying to convince Vietnam to withdraw from Cambodia, right? In your book, you mentioned that Foreign Minister Tak was one of the first uh, prominent Vietnamese leaders to really study capitalism and to try to organize um, debates and research on how capitalism could be uh, coexist with socialism. And my Indonesian friends would always tell me, those who had been involved with um, some of these negotiations, we used to take him around and show him the buildings and show him the factories, show him the standards of living and say, hey, you can achieve this as well. You know, you just have to do this, this, this. And I thought that was fascinating in light of what my Indonesian um, friends had said. And it just reminded me, kind of taking it up to where Vietnam is now, that in 2019, right, when the US was and uh, North Korea were looking for a venue for um, the Kim uh, Trump summit, they chose Vietnam, right? And at least one of the reasons, according to experts, was that so Kim Jong-un, who is extremely isolated, could see Vietnam's progress and envision what his country could look like if it, you know, um, did away with nuclear weapons. So that kind of historical evolution of that issue. And then the other thing, the second major comment, um, that I had was obviously your book focused on, you know, the needs of Vietnam after the Cold War to overcome its isolation, et cetera, et cetera. But in the broader context, ASEAN was on a mission, right, to kind of implement this vision of one Southeast Asia, right? Cold War was over, great powers were left from the region, and that if they could unite, all 10 countries in ASEAN, the region would be more stable and ASEAN would be better able to keep great powers out of the region, right? And it was obviously Vietnam's um, alliance with the Soviet Union that had generated such fears among ASEAN, right? That it facilitated that kind of return to great power politics that they wanted to keep out. And so in this context, one would think that given the very difficult history of 
Vietnam's relations with, you know, Thailand and the Philippines who fought on the side of the US, that integrating Vietnam into ASEAN would have been the tough task, right? But we all know that that wasn't true. That yes, as you know in your book, Flying Blind, as uh, Professor Hang noted, you lacked a lot of English speakers. You didn't understand the economic challenges of getting into AFTA. But Vietnam's integration was easy. Cambodia has had to be delayed for a couple of years due to uh, a coup, right? Hun Sen against Ranarid. And Vietnam, or sorry, Myanmar's was delayed for a couple of years. And there was so much opposition from the West, right, to Myanmar's uh, entry into ASEAN because the army had, you know, brutally repressed a democracy movement. It had refused to um, observe the results of the 1990 elections, place Aung San Suu Kyi under arrest, and that once Myanmar was in, ASEAN hoped that Myanmar would begin to understand the rules, that it would in fact become socialized to use your terms, right? And you specifically in your quote uh, from 2019 say that ASEAN comes not just with rights, but with responsibilities, right? To contribute to a stable order. And that is something that the Myanmar government has never quite seemed to understand, right? So there was this whole period between 1997 when they came in and 2010 when they embarked um, on their roadmap where many of the Western countries, the EU, Australia, uh, the US wouldn't attend meetings with ASEAN if the Myanmar delegation was there. Um, this created huge diplomatic headaches for ASEAN, and it lowered the value of the organization as a mechanism for countries like Vietnam to engage with larger powers. Um, and so I agree with you that in some aspects, Vietnam was flying blind, as you say, but on the basic understanding that you and you know Vietnamese diplomats spend so much time studying, Vietnam got it. You, you knew the rules, right? And part of it was you had to organize your domestic politics so that you didn't create negative spillovers or problems for the region and that you didn't try to cause problems uh, for your neighbors. And so I just want to flag that I think Vietnam actually got a lot right and might have been flying less blind than some of the others. Um, and given, I'll just close uh, with trying to bring this up, is that when we look at how Vietnam has become such a leader in ASEAN, and we look at Myanmar, um, whose February 1st coup has created what many would call an existential crisis for the organization, right? If ASEAN can't help navigate the biggest threat to regional stability, then what is its real raison d'etre? So I guess I would just want to ask whether you agree with this proposition that ASEAN is facing an existential threat from the Myanmar crisis? And if so, what to do beyond the five point consensus that was reached at the summit? So thank you very much. So uh, it's my turn, right? Yes. Yes, and then yeah. I will ask some questions from the audience. But if you would take, if you and, and Ambassador Gu would like to take a little bit of time to respond to uh, Professor yes. Murphy and I. Yes. So it, it sounds like I'm on the uh, dissertation defense again. <laughs> Which, you uh, aced that, so you're <laughs> going to be great here. <laughs> yes. 
Um, I, I, I would uh, think of combining the, uh, my response uh, to the, uh, to the, uh, to the comments posed by Professor Hung and Professor Anne-Marie Murphy. Is it okay? Um, a little bit about, uh, about um, the title. What I, what I indeed want to, um, want to say is about the context where Vietnam has to make has to make the decision by its own without the advice, without the support or help by um, big powers, the way Vietnam did uh, make the decisions before. And with the, uh, <clears throat> uh, with the information it gets from, it got from ASEAN countries in the process of what I call the socialization. So, so, so there are several aspects of, of this decision I want to say. First, the role of ASEAN. ASEAN is helping Vietnam to make the decision. ASEAN did not make the decision for Vietnam. That is in the, in the first place. Um, so, so the process of uh, socialization is just giving the information that Vietnam has to, uh, to, to, to take and Vietnam has to, uh, uh, based on that information, Vietnam has to make the decision by itself. So in another words, the, the, the process of socialization is helping Vietnam to make the decision in a more um, informative way. And the, and the decision is made based on the, com, on the understanding of commonalities. And in the book, I also mentioned the, some strain of thoughts in Hanoi, still focusing on the differences. But the commonalities put into the context of the end of the Cold War was uh, persuasive enough. One, is about like what um, Mary Murphy was saying, the legitimacy. In the context of the end of the Cold War, when the socialist uh, regimes was collapse, collapsing in the Eastern Europe and elsewhere, the matter of legitimacy of the regime was so high on the agenda. And I think that the ASEAN was, the ASEAN cases was telling Vietnam that there are other ways of upholding the legitimacy of the ruling re regime. And this is the developmental uh, model of ASEAN that was successful again at that time. Secondly, it's also a matter of luck. On the one hand, it is about commonality, but on the other hand, it's also a matter of luck because when the decision was made at the the debate or discussion internally, Vietnam was thinking of other options, not only ASEAN. So in the book, I was uh, mentioning uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the efforts by uh, uh, leaders in Hanoi to get closer relations with Beijing, trying to form something like a socialist uh, uh, um, alignment again in the uh, context of the Cold War. And luckily, Beijing was not enthusiastic about that. And of course, uh, the, also the matter of luck beside ASEAN, there was the uh, rapprochement between Vietnam and the United States. And that also, uh, that also uh, uh, added to the uh, reason uh, why Vietnam chose the path of normalizing and, uh, uh, and uh, engaging with, with ASEAN. Uh, and again, in that context where the decision was made locally, uh, we have to highlight some of the uh, people who are really important uh, at that time. And uh, I think um, uh, the role of Mr. Nguyen Gertag, although was not, uh, specifically discussed in the book. Uh, 
but indirectly, uh, it was about his role. And um, you might find the, the discussion about the Politburo resolution number 13 passed in May 1988. And actually, Mr. Uh, uh, Foreign Minister Nguyen was the, uh, uh, the chief architect of that resolution. And the, for me, the very, the most important line in this resolution is that the capitalist uh, development was not uh, alien. It is, a, it is part of human development, humankind development. And if we see it as an integral part of the humankind development, that is something we have to accept and we have to go through that stage before we can get to the later stage of socialism. So it is very scientific uh, in, 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 the, uh, uh, in the, the, the internet debate about foreign policy of Vietnam because it is really a Marxist one. Uh, stages of human humankind development, things like that. And it is really very difficult for other people to, to argue back with him because he, he started with a Marxist approach rather than uh, something else. So, so I think that it is the very uh, persuasive argument that opened the way for Vietnam to integrate with the rest of the region especially when uh, socialism was not successful at that time. So I think that this line is uh, also opened the way for Vietnam to uh, join ASEAN, but also opened the way for Vietnam to have good relations with the United States. And it is very important too, because it is still um, in use right now in the foreign policy of Vietnam when the focus is on international integration. That means Vietnam uh, wants to become an integral part of the uh, production chains of the uh, regional market and the global market. And what it's, uh, it is really happening right now. Um, the second point is the, uh, the next point is, is about um, um, the nature of the research. I think uh, when, when in, the, in the opening remarks, I uh, say that I, I was so happy with the uh, academic and intellectual atmosphere at Columbia University Department of Political Science, where the uh, sympathy or the uh, support to various approaches in international relations studies is so uh, so strong. So um, so by uh, by taking the constructivist approach, I think that I can be myself because I really uh, in love with historical research. So the historical research can be in a good harmony with constructivist because it is telling the story and it doesn't need to be so uh, rigidly theoretic uh, in any research. So, so again, I started with, uh, uh, um, with my historical research on Vietnamese foreign policy, uh, what we call the, the diplomatic history, right? And, and this allowed me to incorporate the um, the knowledge that I learned from the theoretical approaches. So it's a, something like a good uh, union between history and theory. And I find it really uh, uh, at ease when I conduct my, my research. And this research uh, for the most part is so heavily dependent on the ability to have access to documents. And, and it relates to the point raised by Professor Hung about the uh, next generation 
of Vietnamese scholars who are able to have access to um, the documents in Vietnam. Uh, uh, with, uh, with me and Hung uh, being like uh, somebody uh, going before them. Uh, so, so, so that means we, 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 we're old generation, right? And then we are come the younger generation. Uh, the good news is that uh, the uh, atmosphere is more uh, relaxed to conduct such a research. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the archives are open, although partially, but, uh, but uh, uh, Dr. Ming Huang can have great access to the archive centers in Vietnam, and he found many good stuff there. Secondly, uh, the um, retired diplomats are more willing to speak out. They want to share the information they want to share the, uh, the part of the history of diplomacy in Vietnam, and they are more willing to, uh, to speak out. Uh, before we have Mr. Liu Ran Huynh and, and a few other uh, really uh, uh, super uh, uh, diplomatic historians, but the number of, Mr., of, of the like of Mr. Liu Ran Huynh is bigger, I think. The, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, several uh, generations of diplomats who are younger uh, than, Mr., than, than, than Mr. Liu Ran Huynh. And um, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Ambassador Kui and I would join them soon when we uh, retire from the service. <laughs> so, so, so that's number two. Uh, we have more number of uh, scholars like uh, like Mr. Liu Duan Huynh. And uh, number three is that the, uh, the, the political and the social context atmosphere in Vietnam is more open for, uh, for discussion. People are not uh, having so many taboos like we had before. So uh, the, uh, uh, the, the different views are uh, expressed and are seen in a more lenient way. So I think that uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the, the, the context are better now. I still remember when I first joined the department, a person Nathan was telling me that uh, I was in university not for uh, taking the uh, knowledge from the professors, but the professors wants, wants me to contribute. And I think the sense of contribution, especially in the academic and intellectual setting is very important. And it encourages the uh, next generation, generation of scholars from Vietnam to contribute to the uh, debate uh, about whatever related to Vietnam, bringing the views, the voice from Vietnam to become a part of the discussion, discussing table. So I think that, that the, in, in that, I would like to say that the, um, uh, um, the, the, the uh, conditions abroad also very, is also very encouraging for contribution from, uh, for scholars from Vietnam. As about ASEAN and Myanmar, uh, this is, this is, I, I think that, uh, we don't think that ASEAN is facing the uh, existential uh, challenge because uh, uh, everybody needs ASEAN, even Myanmar now, for the very logic that Vietnam uh, was uh, receptive to ASEAN, external conditions, that is the, um, conducive for domestic uh, development, uh, regime, 
uh, legitimacy and uh, collective bargaining power for individual uh, countries uh, when talking with uh, uh, big powers and other countries uh, with uh, in the in in the region and elsewhere. So I think that the same logic as in there for the for the the, the uh, members to um, uh, attach importance to ASEAN, meaning that no one wants to leave ASEAN like Brexit or something like that. Uh, then we have to to go to the uh, question of what ASEAN really is. So this the discussion and the debate is the uh, we have seen this the, most of the time ASEAN is not EU ASEAN is the not uh, uh, is an intergovernmental body things like that and and even the ASEAN is the existent uh, like is existing like that because ASEAN is the institutionally weak things like that but from but when I am based in um, Northeast Asia region, I often come up with the very notion that as uh, that Southeast Asia is very lucky because we have ASEAN. Just imagine that there is some organization like ASEAN in Northeast Asia, things would be radically different. So that is how I, 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 I see ASEAN from now from Northeast Asia. So that leads to my um, comment on uh, what ASEAN can do for Myanmar now. And I, based on the finding in the book, uh, Flying Blind, I would say that there, are, again, the socializing process is very important for Myanmar now. And the very fact that uh, the military leader took part in the discussion in the uh, summit recently in Indonesia to show, is just to show that the socializing process is still going on, even with Myanmar. It is not the question of recognizing uh, the, 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 the uh, junta, but it is the matter of socializing. And see, see from this approach, I think uh, this story is repeated in the sense of the efforts made by the ASEAN countries to socialize the members, especially when the member is in the difficult time. Uh, there are three aspects of uh, socializing, and I and I think that it is very important. Uh, uh, if we can make the connection between what was going on in the case of Vietnam joining ASEAN, and um, and uh, and what we want to do with other countries who are in the, the difficult transition. Uh, first is experience sharing. Second is capacity building. And third is engaging in terms of facilitating the participations in the forums and participation in the regional cooperation projects. So, uh, so in, in, in the book, uh, there was a dis discussion on the importance of visits, especially high-level visits by party ships of Vietnam, like Mr. Do Mui and Mr. Nguyen Van Linh, uh, receiving uh, the uh, leaders from ASEAN, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew and Mr. Su Hato going to Vietnam and Vietnamese leaders going to the ASEAN regions. It's just to the way of sharing the experience. We, if we do that, you can achieve the level of development like this. And this is so persuasive. It is something like a uh, first-hand information. So it's, uh, it's experience sharing. 
and capacity building is really important because we need the new, the whole new generation of people who are really uh, at work, who have to do the things after the decision uh, was made. And, uh, and part of the <clears throat> uh, flying blind aspect is that when Vietnam decided to join ASEAN, we have a, a great lack of uh, partners who are not, uh, who, who must be conversant on ASEAN, not only on ASEAN, but on international cooperation and on the, um, uh, and on the, the, um, the specific task of diplomacy. Uh, uh, so in the book, I was uh, uh, discussing about uh, the lack of uh, the cutters who are uh, elix, uh, fluent, who can uh, uh, initiate the project and who can uh, lead or who can share the discussions, who can share the meetings. So we have people like Ambassador Quy, Ambassador Ngoc, uh, Ambassador Quy at the UN, Ambassador Ngoc in Washington. We see the 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 the, uh, the growth of uh, the uh, foreign uh, uh, of the diplomats of Vietnam, but it is 2000. It is. 2020, and just think back of 1990 when Vietnam suddenly was in need of such a contingent of diplomats who can, uh, who could uh, participate in some like 200 meetings a year. So, so, so that is the sense of uh, uh, of, of uh, need in terms of uh, capacity building. And the third is the, the engaging, like I said, participation in uh, cooperative project, participation in meetings and participation in um, the dialogue of ASEAN with uh, external partners. And that is really, that is really um, uh, important. And, um, and experience sharing, capacity building and engaging are so helpful for the uh, socialization process. Just think of, say, North Korea right now. We do not, uh, we haven't done much in all the three aspects, experience sharing, capacity building and engaging. And the platform for such activities is ASEAN. So think of Myanmar again. So Myanmar uh, experience sharing, maybe uh, we have done a little bit about that, but capacity building, I don't think that uh, the number of um, Myanmar people send abroad to studies in say graduate uh, programs like we enjoyed were enough. And the tendency right now is to shut the doors for Myanmar from engaging in the activities uh, that we need the participation of Myanmar just to show that we uh, uh, care about Myanmar. So, so I, I think that the, the study on Vietnam's decision, decision to join ASEAN is a very specific case uh, in a very specific uh, time and location. But the implication is that we can help some other countries that are in the transitional period, very important for their development. And the case of Vietnam, engaging with ASEAN, I mean, having good relations with ASEAN that end up with the membership of ASEAN just reflects the three points that I have just mentioned, experience sharing, capacity building, and engaging. And I think that the historical uh, research can suggest something, like I said, hopeful and um, optimistic about helping other countries going through the transition.
I think Ambassador Kui wanted to jump in right now uh, before I'll ask the questions that have appeared in Q&A. But if uh, Ambassador Tom, if you would like to look at them quickly um, and then I'll point them out to you. But Ambassador Kui. Thank you, Lien Hung, and I, I joined uh, to, to take uh, some point. First of all, the point of Lien Hung. And um, I, I share with them that we see an increasing trend of the young generation of the Vietnamese, including the diplomats, who are interested in history and interested in study and publish on international relations. I think this is a very good point, especially the Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam and uh, other institutions in Vietnam. They produce a lot of PhDs. And now they're working in the system, so they know the story. And I think that sometime in their career, if they have time or they going to retire like us, they can looking back and they contribute. And uh, you know very well that the pioneer of the you know, foreign service in Vietnam, who make a bridge between the domestic and international relation is a, a Deputy Prime Minister Nguyen Cơ Thành since early 70s. And he did great job in 1990s in making the, the, the Vietnamese leadership understand about international relations, understand about outside world, rather than the Soviet bloc. So that make, you know, the, the theory of socialization of Professor Dung with works. Um, I think that the, but the problem of, you know, classification and declassification, it takes time. I hope that in the next 10 years, we will have a, a clearer legal frameworks for declassification of all the archive at 10 years, I think, 10 years. And because one missing period in the histories of Vietnamese diplomacy, the period from 1976 and 1991, very few writing and very, very few reading. And people who are witnessed and who are participated are during this period of time now they are getting very old and some people passing already. And you know that beside Deputy Prime Minister Nguyen Cơ Thanh, we have others like Trần Quang Cơ and Lê Mai passed away already, Lê Đơn Huynh passed away already, but others still alive. I mean, the Vũ Khoan need the very few people right, witness and who know the story, we need to tap him more and more. Because not only people in the foreign service in Vietnam during this period, but on other office on, also, they have a very great contribution to opening the mindset of the Vietnamese leaders. So that makes the socialization works. Yeah. And I would like want to add several points raised by, um, um, by Anne Marie. Yeah, the one is about, is about um, I mean, um, Flying blight. Yes. I agree with Tung about 50% that um, we look at the maybe it's a starting point about flying blight. Yes, starting point blight. But after that, it's not blight at all. We're opening up our, our eyes and we see. And also, it's not totally blight when we're starting up because strategically, it's not blight. But Maybe technically or functionally, we blind because we don't know how it, the, the mechanism in ASEAN works economically and socially, but it's not blind strategically. And we know ASEAN commonality, at least in two things. I know I fully share with Anne Marie about you know, diversity, the by diversity of Southeast Asia. Yeah. We are so different, but we are like at least two points. One is the national development goal we share. And the second, the way we deal with the power. Why we have ASEAN? We, we all want to make a group to deal with the power, to increase our bargaining power with them. Yeah. So I think that, uh, that, that is unique and consistent from the beginning. I think Vietnam knows very well about that. So not blind at all. And um, in Myanmar, I think socialization can work. But I think socialization, it takes time and it takes different process in different countries. In Vietnam, it takes 10 years, more than 10 years from 1976. Yeah, I, if I'm not wrong that the, the discussion about joining ASEAN started from 1976, 1978. But by then people look at Soviet Asia like Seattle. Yeah. So if ASEAN like Seattle, no one 
want to join. But then with that, 10 years later, especially in 1986, because we are nearly collapsed because of China's threat, because of Soviet Union is a collapse. And also in 1988, that Tung was right that we have another offer about that, uh, you know, so uh, communist ally. Once because China didn't want. They are not confident enough. But if China now is different. Yeah. And second thing that 1988 incidents, yeah. China took seven, um, seven pictures in South China Sea and killed a lot of people there. So it wakes up the anti-Chinese sentiment among the Vietnamese and also among the Vietnamese leader about that and pushed Vietnam towards the outside world harder. So this is one, one thing. We have no other choice. Yeah. Um, about Myanmar now, I think that. One, they say socialization is a long time. For Vietnam, it take, say, 12 years. Myanmar take 40 years. And you see, it worked because if we look at the uh, situation in Myanmar is from 1962, the coup d'etat until 2008, they, they have the constitution and Tencent came into power. It's changing their mindset. And it's also changing their you know, policy since they joined ASEAN, but it's slowly, slowly. And then we have uh, 2016 election. Yeah. But why it happened now? Because they are, I mean, regime survivor. They're threatened by the, I mean, the overwhelming victory of NND, the election. Yeah. So socialization in Myanmar takes more time than in Vietnam, but maybe it still works. And again, I think that if we apply one theory to explain any incident in history, it does not work all. But in the case of Vietnam, looking for ASEAN policy and working, working toward ASEAN, uh, I agree with them that constructivism, socialization is uh, explained the most. But the other theory also explain as well. Yeah, we will put harder and something like that. So all everything complement, complementary, every theory complementary to each other and it makes the full picture of the life. Yeah, and what to do with the five points? No way, but continue engagement. I agree with you that ASEAN are now facing with the greatest tests because Myanmar crisis now is interstate crisis. Interstate crisis, ASEAN did very well. Yeah, I mean, the Fred be here incident between Cambodia and Thailand, for example, and between Malaysia and Indonesia, something. Between states, okay. But interesting that we are tied with the non-interference principle. No way. But I mean, little and little socialization and continued engagement. Yeah, I think ASEAN continue work that way, bilaterally, by group, or by all the group together. Yeah. I was asked the same questions in my meeting with the press. But they criticize by ASEAN, talk shop. Not to do at all. And then I asked them question, what are, if not ASEAN, give me another alternative. No answer. So there are a couple of points I want to raise here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Kui. Um, so I'm going to turn this now over to, we, we only have a few minutes left. So what I would like uh, Ambassador Thum to do is, um, if you look in Q&A, this is actually a pretty good segue because a bunch of the questions came from uh, uh, Huang Min Wu, who, um, Wu Min Huang, who we've been talking about right now. Uh, but the questions seem to group around the role of China uh, in, in um, uh, Vietnam's decision not to join ASEAN. Uh, that was asked by um, by Huang. There's a question. Mm. Well, in any case, I'll let you if you want to um, choose which question you would like to answer. As we we've mm. been getting a few, so I'll I'll turn it over to you for the final final words, Ambassador Phil. Thank you, Professor Hung. I would like to uh, make a couple of points here. One about flying blind, which is the title. It doesn't mean that. Uh, 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 that that Vietnam was the um, was the unaware of what is uh, of ASEAN, what ASEAN was. 
even even though the level of uh, knowledge was low. But what I really meant by offering this uh, book, that title is the, the situation when Vietnam has to rely on its own to make the decision using its, whatever it has to make the decision. And luckily the decision was the right one and it has a long lasting impact on the present uh, foreign policy uh, of Vietnam. That's point number one. Point number two is about uh, uh, constructivism itself. And that relates to uh, the points raised by Professor Anne-Marie Murphy. I am uh, of the came arguing that identity is not something there for you to discover. And I uh, more uh, uh, supportive of the idea of ASEAN, uh, sorry, uh, identity is something that is the product of the process of socialization. The more we interact with each other, the more we find the common commonality and differences. And to the case of Vietnam, it is a happy case because the interactors find more commonalities, especially the most important one, the foreign policy goals and regime le legitimacy. And that is a happy case because in other type of interactions, people happen to find more differences than commonalities. So the, uh, the, my research suggests that Vietnam was lucky to find the commonalities with ASEAN and that based the foreign policy decision. Um, uh, Huang raised a point about uh, uh, the uh, forceful argument for constructivism, and he made the case that in fact, Vietnam was making the decision based on classic realism. I have no argument with that. I totally agree because other ASEAN countries also base their uh, foreign policy decisions on classic realism, national interest, security, prosperity for the countries, things like that. And, that. and that is the foundation for commonality, the recognition of commonality. So it is the uh, constructivist in the sense that the decision makers, both in Vietnam and other uh, capitals in Southeast Asia are like each other because they are all classic realists. So no, no, I, I, I see the, uh, <clears throat> uh, no, uh, um, no, um, I mean, no, uh, no differences in this. And the same realist, a classical realist calculation can form the type of commonality between Vietnam's uh, leaders and uh, so other Southeast Asians back in the uh, late 1980s and early 1990s. Um, Huang also raised the point of why, asking why China did not accept the offer by Vietnam uh, to form something like a socialist alliance. Uh, we need some more dissertation on that, I think. But in my uh, uh, research, I uh, let uh, I have uh, come up with several uh, following uh, answers. One is the uh, reluctance from China when it was facing the uh, embargo and isolation caused by the Tiananmen Square incident. Number two is the hesitance to become so visibly socialist here because that would, in the, in the word of Chang Jimin, that would draw fires rather than sympathy. So it, this is the reason why China was hesitant. And uh, number three was China's foreign policy at the time was so focusing also on the improvement of China's re relations with ASEAN. So I think that, that the, the three uh, points that I have just mentioned was kind of 
suggestive enough to explain why China was not uh, was not uh, receptive to Vietnam's offer. Uh, it doesn't mean that China want to get uh, Vietnam out of control, as it is always uh, like that. But uh, I think that um, there might be the calculation of China that even Vietnam joined ASEAN, ASEAN was not big enough, strong enough to counter China as a collective uh, entity. So it doesn't uh, ring, it doesn't, uh, uh, it would not become a threat if China, uh, if Vietnam joined ASEAN. So I think that uh, that somehow explained the, uh, the 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 willingness, I may call it, of China to support Vietnam to join to join ASEAN. So so um, what point that I should uh, address? Um, okay, so. Um, I I got a question from Chang Nguyen about uh, uh, ASEAN operated uh, not sorry sorry yes. uh, how does ASEAN influence Vietnam's ongoing legal reform projects? I would borrow. Um, Ambassador Quiz's uh, uh, notion here that ASEAN is the bind is bound by the principle of uh, uh, non-interference. Uh, so ASEAN doesn't doesn't uh, uh, ask members to do anything domestically. But like I said, the uh, experience sharing is very important. So ASEAN does not teach Vietnam, but Vietnam can learn from ASEAN. That is the difference. ASEAN does not teach, but Vietnam can learn. And I think that Vietnam can learn many things, including legal economy, uh, legal uh, reform, economic reforms, and uh, et cetera. So I think that by way of indirect, uh, indirectly giving uh, the um, examples ASEAN was also helping Vietnam in terms of legal reforms. So I would answer that, that question that way. Yeah. Thank you so, so much. Oh, sorry, Ambassador yeah, Tom. Yeah. I think we are actually um, out of time. Um, this was going to 1030. I'm going to still be here. Uh, so if you'd like, what we could also do is we have your questions on the Q&A. Um, if you include in the chat in, in that, if you have your, an email address, uh, Ambassador Thom can uh, answer your questions um, uh, by sending you an email. So thank you so much. Uh, for joining us today, everyone here in the audience, and especially thanks to you, uh, Ambassador Thom, uh, for giving such a great uh, book talk. Uh, congratulations again, um, and go out and buy it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Hang, for connecting all of us in such a very wonderful event. So stay in touch and stay safe. And uh, I am in Seoul until 2023, so please, in the next two years and a half, please make any opportunity available to you to travel to this part of the world so that I can welcome you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. And bye bye, and bye bye, and